All my life, I've wanted to be a bank robber. Now that it's finally happened, I think I'm almost the best thief this country has ever seen. My success is evident. I've robbed over a dozen banks, taking hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. To pull off my heists, I just need my gang, my gun, and a fast car. If you aim to be the most wanted man in America, you've got to be ready for the heat. They won't stop me, or they'll have to take me out. In the pursuit of public enemy number one, Edgar Hoover, the first director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, orders Melvin Purvis, the man in charge in Chicago, to drop everything and find John Dillinger. By 1933, bank robbers had become so successful that for the first time, some of the largest banks began to occasionally station guards. However, the challenge wasn't just about getting in, showing a gun, and taking the money. The real problem was escaping. John Dillinger proved to be skilled at this task, getting in and out quickly and making sure the getaway car was ready. He taunted the law and defied death, believing himself invincible. But challenging everyone so closely made him realize it was better to start disappearing now. John Dillinger was the most wanted man in America, public enemy number one. Dillinger's fame was solidified during the Great Depression, an economic apocalypse in which many Americans lost their jobs and homes due to foreclosures on their farms. The relationship between the American people and their banks was hostile, considering the villains who seized their possessions through foreclosures. The Depression turned honest men into petty thieves, and although prohibition had already created a generation of outlaws, the acceptance of certain illegal activities, especially those perceived as victimless, made an entire generation of Americans more comfortable with criminal behavior than ever before. Perhaps they would have been before. John came from a modest background in Indiana, born in Indianapolis. From an early age, he had problems. Although he was bright and intelligent, he was unruly and got into a lot of trouble. Like everyone else, the first thing he stole was a chicken. He enjoyed the usual things. He went away to the Navy for a while, but couldn't handle the discipline. So, he came back home to pick up where he left off. Dillinger's first major crime was robbing a storekeeper named Frank Morgan in his hometown. In Morrisville, Dillinger was frankly an inept thief. One night, apparently after drinking too much, he and another guy decided they needed more money. They took a large metal bolt, wrapped it in cloth, hit a man on the head with it, and took quite a bit of money. Dillinger was arrested immediately. He didn't ask for a lawyer and foolishly agreed with the prosecutor to plead guilty to this minor crime. People told him that if he pleaded guilty, he would only get a slap on the wrist, and it was a slap, but it was still a direct hit to the face. To Dillinger's and his family's surprise, he was sent to prison for a 10 to 20 year sentence for a drunken and foolish robbery of a storekeeper. What's fascinating is that while entering the reformatory as a fool and amateur, he met many future members of his gang and earned a PhD in crime. He learned the PhD in crime. He learned the necessities of the trade from the experts. What he learned in prison wasn't just about money in banks and having a gun. He learned how to systematize bank robbery. He identified a series of tasks that needed to be done with each gang member taking on one of these roles. The vault man, the lobby man, the man covering the lobby, the guy at the door, and the getaway driver. The most important element of all was the escape plan. After serving eight and a half years, he was granted parole and was now ready to put his education to the test. Dillinger wasted no time. The kid from Indiana who could barely rob a storekeeper was now capable of stealing police-grade bulletproof vests and high-powered machine guns, which gives an idea of how incredibly sophisticated he became in crime while in prison. If Dillinger was a novice before, you could say he became a professional after robbing his first bank and a handful more in no time. It was what we could call a hot streak. In one of his many robberies, the police arrested him 
and he was incarcerated in the state prison, awaiting trial. A few days later, some of Dillinger's friends who had escaped from the Indiana State Prison appeared, dressed in uniforms before the prison sheriff, posing as agents who wanted to transfer the prisoner back to the Indiana Penitentiary. The sheriff didn't believe them, and when he asked for their credentials, one of the criminals pulled out a gun and shot him. They then took the keys, freed Dillinger from his cell, and locked the sheriff's wife in another cell before escaping. Although none of these criminals had specifically violated any federal laws, the assistance of the FBI was required for their capture. Identification and Location After the Identification Division confirmed his identity through fingerprints, they began their search for his capture. Meanwhile, the gang robbed several banks. In these heists, there were very few deaths, and in some cases none. The public, Reading the news in the newspapers and irritated with the bankers for the recessionary effects of the Great Depression, began to idealize Dillinger as a Robin Hood-like figure, with notable personal style. Even the gang members seemed to be discreet about the violence used in their robberies. Dillinger enjoyed the thrill of bank robbing. He wasn't just a thug, it wasn't his style. But he liked the drama of it all. Even so, Friction and violence were inevitable in their grand performance. John Hamilton, one of his gang members, shot and killed an agent in Chicago. A month later, during a shootout, the gang killed Officer William O'Malley in a robbery at the First National Bank of East Chicago. Dillinger would enter the bank and sing his usual line. This is a robbery. Hands up and step aside. During this particular heist, there weren't as many people involved. Typically, their robberies had between four and six people, but the job in Chicago was done with only two or three. It didn't fit my usual pattern of heists, but it had to be done. The police burst in, and we froze. I aimed the gun at them, saying, I'm not going to shoot you, but this time, things got a little out of control. The gang ultimately had to kill Officer William O'Malley. It wasn't characteristic of Dillinger to kill people gratuitously. Dillinger wasn't in the business of murder. He was in the business of being a successful bank robber. But he was perfectly willing to kill to get the money he felt was rightfully his. I've always felt bad about the death of people, but it was just part of the job. Honestly, no one was 100 sure who killed that officer. The fact is, it doesn't even matter who actually pulled the trigger. If people believe you shot a cop, that's bad news. The outcome of the bank robbery in Chicago was devastating, as it meant he could now face the death penalty if he went to trial. He would probably have been found guilty and sentenced to death. So, at that moment, everything changed for him. He had everything to gain by escaping and everything to lose if he were caught. One thing was very clear. He had no plans of being captured by the government or anyone else. Laws were written in such a way that if a bank was robbed, for example, in Michigan, the FBI faced difficulties turning it into a federal crime. The FBI didn't have the authority to investigate that robbery. One of the reasons Dillinger was so successful and had such longevity was that once you left a county, the sheriff wouldn't pursue you. The gang subsequently moved to Florida and then to Tucson, Arizona. There, on January 23, 1934, a fire broke out at the hotel where Clark and Muley, members of the gang, were hiding under false names. Firefighters recognized the men from their photographs, and a local police officer arrested them, along with Dillinger and other members. Several firearms and over $5,000 in cash, which represented a fortune at the time, were found, including part of the loot from the bank robbery in Chicago. By then, Dillinger was becoming a true national figure. He had left behind the guise of a simple Indiana bandit and was appearing in national newspapers. Dillinger was facing a charge of murder for the death of the police officer in the Chicago bank. The long arm of the law had reached John Dillinger and took his first flight in an airplane. Received in Chicago with an incredible scene, crowds of press and a motorcycle convoy to escort him back to prison.
Some said I was arrogant, and with good reason, I was more famous than them, smarter and better looking. Right next to Dillinger was the prosecutor, and in a nearly iconic photo, Dillinger put his arm around the prosecutor's shoulder and laughed. It was quite funny, as he boasted that he would escape from prison as if he didn't care at all. Dillinger was sent to the prison in Indiana, which was said to be escape proof. Fugitive escape groups surrounded it with shotguns and paraded through the streets. Additionally, there were several locked doors and a long corridor that any inmate would have to navigate without being detected to get out. The authorities boasted a lot about how the prison was escape proof. All this talk about a famous escape proof prison. I swear people are tempting fate, or at least tempting me, but most of the time, you don't escape from prison by picking locks or fighting your way out. You escape with cunning, and that's something I have plenty of. On March 3, 1934, Dillinger used one of his tricks to escape. He carved an object shaped like a gun out of an unspecified material, possibly a bar of soap or a piece of wood, and intimidated the prison guards into opening his cell so he could flee. After locking up his custodians, this incident further paved his way to fame. The story was widely disbelieved. Such a thing could never have happened. But in fact, it seems to have been true. He managed to take a couple of guards hostage with this makeshift gun. However, at some point, he made his way through these locked doors, went down the stairs where he obtained two Thompson submachine guns and managed to leave the building unnoticed. He then went outside to the garage and stole the sheriff's car. A fine Ford Vate. As you know, I have a high regard for those cars. I even wrote to Ford himself praising the vehicle. The press mocked this action and published headlines making fun of the sheriff, which only increased the robber's popularity. However, the fugitive made the mistake of crossing the state line into Indiana in the stolen vehicle, thereby violating a federal law and involving the FBI in his capture. What good is the FBI in his capture? What good is the FBI? What good is Edgar Hoover if they aren't pursuing Dillinger? This car theft was the card Hoover needed to play to get into the game. The manpower and weaponry of the FBI could now be directed towards John Dillinger. I'm Melvin Purvis from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and I have my orders to capture John Dillinger at any cost. There will be blood and glory but not enough of one and too much of the other. Suddenly, Dillinger was receiving a lot of attention, unwanted attention. Perhaps what propelled him from being a national figure to the most famous criminal in the world was his prison escape. Now, he was the most wanted man in America. Public enemy number one, the top bank robber in the country. That was great. But being public enemy number one also brought its own set of problems. The FBI was closing in like dogs at the dinner table. They had entered the pursuit of Dillinger after the prison escape. Almost all other high-profile cases in the office took a back seat as Hoover ordered the man in charge, Melvin Purvis, to basically drop everything and find John Dillinger. Meanwhile, some members of the gang were sentenced to death for murder, while others received life sentences. After this, Dillinger teamed up with his girlfriend, Evelyn Friest, and later allied with other criminals, including the infamous babyface, Nelson. With this second gang, he also managed to execute major bank heists. The public enemy now ascended to fame as an underworld hero, and here I was on the silver screen, just like the movie stars. Given the amount of press I received, it was no surprise that there were very few places where I could disappear except St. Paul. In that crazy city, my girl and I could remain unnoticed. The police in that city were so corrupt and so willing to take bribes that a public enemy like John Dillinger could walk down the street, greet the police, and they would tip their hats without reporting or arresting him. This was the safest city in the United States for a criminal. Tracking Dillinger wasn't easy, but then the St. Paul police received a tip from the landlady about her new tenants. The curtains were always drawn, and she could never get a glimpse into the apartment. In St. Paul, seeing something a bit odd wasn't unusual, as it housed many public enemies of the time. 
However, the landlady decided to call the police, thinking maybe someone had an illegal still or something. Two young officers went out to check, thinking it would be nothing. They knocked on the door, and a voice said it was Billy, Dillinger's girlfriend, saying she wasn't decent and would be out in a moment. They kept knocking, and then, boom, Dillinger burst through the door, and amidst gunfire, John Dillinger, public enemy number one, the most wanted man in America, escaped once again. It was thrilling, except for getting shot. I must have really ticked them off. I simply jumped and took off. You know what they call me, right? The rabbit, because I just disappear, and no one can catch me. I like that name and the reputation that comes with it. The embarrassment for the FBI was huge, but still, Edgar Hoover was trying to justify his burgeoning police force. Dillinger was a strong argument for the need for a powerful FBI. Hoover's ambitions for the FBI were such that they needed to be a force capable of dealing with the nation's number one villain. In a way, the encounter between Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, and John Dillinger was the perfect match. They were made for each other. Dillinger was the best thing that could have happened to Edgar Hoover. Dillinger made Hoover and the FBI what they are today. After the recent confrontation, Dillinger and his girlfriend, Evelyn, went to Morrisville, where they stayed at his father's and stepbrother's house until his wound healed. Subsequently, the FBI lost track of Dillinger three, four, and even five times within a matter of weeks. The trick was to keep moving. So I decided to find a safe house in a place with someone I thought I could trust. I was becoming too arrogant. The FBI had received a tip that I was meeting with a mafia contact at a local tavern. For some reason, I had to send my girl to check if our contact was there. It was one of the biggest mistakes I made. The FBI managed to arrest Dillinger's girlfriend and sentenced her to a $1,000 fine and two years in prison for being an active accomplice. Now Dillinger was absolutely distraught. He had to get her out of there. He loved her, that was clear. He was consumed with talking and planning ways to rescue her until it seemed she sent him a note saying, John, don't do it. The worst that will happen to me is a year and a day for being an accomplice. And besides, if you get caught, they'll kill you. Well, my father always says that hard work cures all ills. And he's not wrong. With Billy in jail, all I can do is what I do best. Rob Banks. I know the pressure is mounting with Hoover's public enemy strategy. It's turning me into a star, making Hoover himself a star. Edgar Hoover wanted John Dillinger to be infamous, so that when the FBI took Dillinger down, Hoover could claim all the credit to Congress and say, if we didn't have a federal police force like the FBI, we couldn't catch filthy rats like Dillinger. Hoover needed to make the FBI even more powerful. So, Edgar Hoover realized that his career and the future of the FBI rested on one thing, killing John Dillinger. Subsequently, one Sunday night, Melvin Purvis received a phone call with a tip that Dillinger and his men were hiding out in a rustic resort in the Wisconsin woods. For some reason, something about this call sounded true. This was their chance. Dillinger was a big prize, and the icing on the cake was that he was holed up with someone as dangerous as Babyface Nelson. They used airplanes, which was crucial because they had very little time. Purvis essentially moved heaven and earth to gather every available FBI agent from Chicago and the surrounding areas. So the FBI flew to Wisconsin to capture and hopefully kill John Dillinger. We went to Little Bohemia to take a break. I guess the feds don't believe in taking vacations, but they'll regret interrupting ours. When Melvin Purvis and his FBI team arrived on a dark road outside, they managed to get the element of surprise. Although Dillinger was inside, they should have been able to surround the place and capture him. However, none of these FBI agents were trained for a shootout in the dark and in the wilderness, so they stumbled over each other. The FBI was completely unprepared. Everything that could go wrong did. 
Amid the nerves and adrenaline, they observed a car driving away. The FBI had orders to shoot to kill. They had been humiliated by Dillinger's previous escapes. So Purvis and several agents began shouting, Halt! Stop! Fie! Federal agents! Unfortunately, the car's radio was on and quite loud. They didn't hear the agents and shifted gears to speed away. The FBI opened fire on the car. It wasn't Dillinger's gang. It was a conservation worker who had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. An innocent man was killed by the FBI and another was injured. But the worst part for the FBI was that their gunfire in the middle of the night alerted Dillinger's gang to their presence. They looked out the window and saw a group of agents stumbling in the dark. It was then that Dillinger babyface Nelson and the rest of the gang realized they were in serious trouble. The FBI was in the woods. There was an exchange of gunfire. Dillinger and some of the gang members opened fire from the second floor rooms. Babyface Nelson killed Agent Carter Baum and all the gang members fled in various directions, outwitting the agents. The aftermath of Little Bohemia was dramatic. That night was certainly the lowest point in FBI history up to that time, and by any measure, it remains one of the lowest points in FBI history to this day. Melvin Purvis, in particular, was devastated because an FBI agent was killed under his supervision. The raid's failure led to the death of a comrade. All the political capital and media attention they had accumulated in the previous months was suddenly squandered. Edgar Hoover became a laughingstock. Dillinger was the first public enemy labeled as a superstar. A notorious celebrity, but a celebrity. But a celebrity nonetheless. Everyone in the United States knew who he was. Don't get me wrong, he loved the attention. But having one of the most recognizable faces in the country when you have a price on your head is not good for business. In the following weeks and months, Dillinger tried to change his appearance by visiting some surgeons, perhaps to remove some moles and that distinctive cleft in his chin. The FBI received many tips, but most of them led nowhere. They hadn't made much progress until they got a breakthrough. They received a phone call from the Chicago police, from a detective named Martin Zarkovich. The detective had a source. The source's name was Anna and she reported that a man named Jimmy Lawrence was staying with her. But he was actually John Dillinger. This made sense, as Anna and Dillinger had a prior relationship. Anna had significant reasons for turning him in, as she had just received a letter from the immigration department warning her that she was about to be deported back to her native Romania. She decided that this was an opportunity to claim the substantial reward for Dillinger and also seek assistance from the immigration department to avoid deportation. Meanwhile, I was hiding out in Anna's brothel, but it wasn't long before I started to go a little stir. Crazy. I needed to get out and get some fresh air with my new girl, Polly, of course. Anna reported a plan where she, John Dillinger, and Dillinger's new girlfriend, Polly Hamilton, would go to the movies together. They left nothing to chance after the previous fiasco. Dillinger had left the agency on its knees. Now, three months later, it was time for revenge. The plan was that, when the crowd exited the theater, Melvin Purvis would look for Dillinger. When he saw him, he would light a small cigar he was holding, signaling everyone to move. The area around the theater was surrounded by more than a dozen armed agents, as the FBI wanted to make absolutely sure they got the right guy after all these mishaps. Purvis's hand trembled so much that he struggled to light the match. As Dillinger walked along the sidewalk, the agents began closing in on him. When Dillinger realized something was wrong, he drew his gun and started running down the alley. At that moment, the agents fired and killed him instantly. To give an idea of Dillinger's celebrity and notoriety, women leaned over his body and soaked their petticoats and dresses in his blood hoping to take a piece of the life force of public enemy number one with them. It was more than just the heat that made my skin crawl. It was suddenly clear to me that I had been set up. The headlines that followed Dillinger's death were astounding, not just in Chicago but also in New York, and abroad in London, Tokyo, and Berlin. 
he had become an international figure. Something about John Dillinger, his story and his manhunt clearly resonated with the world. The irony of it all was that he was considered a movie star and died near a theater. Dillinger's life was a film, and people read it like a script and saw it like a movie. Anyone over 60 or 70 still has a story about Dillinger. He became part of Chicago's lore and American tradition. And the truth is, it's as compelling as the legend itself. If you enjoyed the story of John Dillinger, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more gripping tales from history's underworld. Stay tuned for our next episode. Thank you for watching.